our guest speaker, um, Luke Mayville, who, uh, as I mentioned, is from uh, uh, Reclaim Idaho. He's a author, an educator, and an organizer. As I mentioned, he's from Reclaim Idaho, which is an organization he co-founded with his friends, uh, Emily and Garrett's, hope I, I'm probably gonna mispronounce their, their name, but uh, Strzic. Um, and that, that is a political organization that aims to win change through grassroots organizing uh, in, in every Idaho community. Uh, in 2017, uh, Reclaim Idaho launched a statewide petition campaign to get a Medicaid expansion uh, effort uh, in the state through a ballot initiative. Uh, they got a big green camper van and basically drove it to more or less every town in Idaho, uh, knocking on doors and getting people to sign on to this, this effort, uh, which was ultimately a success. Um, they secured Medicare uh, expansion in Idaho rescuing people from the Medicaid gap of coverage. Uh, basically a lot of people were uh, not well off, but still not um, qualifying for Medicaid. Um, and they, they remedied that. Uh, that was the subject of a uh, acclaimed documentary film also called Reclaim Idaho. Uh, they received coverage uh, in Vice, NBC News, Buzzfeed, Politico, other outlets uh, in Idaho and around the country. And right now they're working to improve uh, K through 12 education funding in the state. Uh, Idaho is, um, I think, one of the last states in the union, if not the, the lowest in terms of uh, K through 12 funding. And uh, in addition to that work, uh, Luke is the author of the book, John Adams and the Fear of an American Oligarchy from Princeton University Press. And he lectures uh, political philosophy at uh, Boise State University's Honors College. So quite the impressive guy and we're very happy to have him here. So um, Luke, I'm gonna try to give you screen share if you don't have it already or if somebody else can, I don't see it. Okay, well, thank you so much, Pete. And I will, <clears throat> I, don't really need, I don't really need screen share. I'm, okay. I'll just talk uh, more informally here. And I'd just like to tell a little bit of our story and, um, you know, our meaning Reclaim Idaho, our, our, or, our or, uh, grassroots organization in Idaho. And I'll end pretty quickly and I'd love to open up for questions because I think the most interesting um, aspect of having me on this call would be for you all to hear our story, think about how it might apply to your work and then just feel free to pepper me with any questions that, that come to mind so we can maybe connect some dots and, and maybe generate some insights. Um, so you might be familiar with Medicaid expansion. Let me just say a little bit more about what Medicaid expansion is because it's quite a bit different than Medicare for all. Um, it's, I, I see it as perfectly consistent with Medicare for all. It's a, it's a step on the way towards Medicare for all. But what Medicaid expansion is, it's a, it's a part of Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act originally. Um, in, you know, the, the, the best known part of Obamacare is the state exchanges. But in fact, the biggest success story of Obamacare, um, though less talked about, is the fact that o Obamacare uh, included a very substantial expansion of the Medicaid program uh, that was create Medicaid, of course, created in 1965 alongside Medicare, um, Medicaid uh, being in most states before Obamacare, what Medicaid basically covered um, was the lowest income people for the most part and children and some amount of long-term care and some amount of care for uh, people with certain disabilities. Before the Obamacare Medicaid expansion came along in 2010, uh, the income levels for, for being eligible for Medicaid were extremely low. So you basically had to be like dirt poor to qualify for, for Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid expansion really opened it up to a pretty large group of working people, working families, um, and it also importantly, opened it up for people without children. 
Medicaid, at least as far as I'm, I understand in, in most states, if not all states, prior to the Obamacare Medicaid expansion, you had to be a parent to qualify. Um, what Medicaid expansion did is it said, we're gonna expand Medicaid for everyone um, under 60, for all adults under 65, regardless of whether or not you have children, um, all the way up into, and I say all the way, this isn't very far, but it's a lot farther than it was before, um, up till to $17,000 a year for, um, for an individual. And then that amount goes up the larger your family is. So for a family of four, I believe it's closer to about $30,000 a year. So we're still talking about very low incomes, but that's a really large expansion. So to give you, and that covers a lot of people. So to give you a sense in Texas, they have not expanded Medicaid still. And if they expanded Medicaid, they would cover 1 million people. Uh, so they're by not expanding, they're leaving all those people without health care. Now, something just if, if you're not familiar with this history, um, Medicaid expansion has been the biggest success story of Obamacare, um, other than perhaps the uh, provisions around pre-existing conditions. Those have also arguably been a pretty, pretty big success. I would argue been a pretty big success story. Um, Medicaid expansion even more so. Uh, it, it just ex expanded comprehensive government-sponsored health coverage to millions of people around the country. Tragically, what happened um, in 2012, the Supreme Court took up the question of whether they're going to uphold Obamacare. And you'll, you'll likely remember that they upheld it, um, narrowly upheld, upheld, upheld Obamacare. Um, but just as people were rejoicing, so many people around the country were rejoicing that they upheld Obamacare, uh, a lot of people ignored a really important provision of that ruling, which was that the court, the, the, the Roberts court ruled that the Medicaid expansion part of Obamacare is optional for states. So states won't, don't, don't have to expand Medicaid. And for people like me from a red state, that was tragic because what immediately happened is that all the states run by Democrats kept the Medicaid expansion, all the states run by Republicans rejected it. And they refused to take the federal dollars, um, massive amounts of federal money. They just refused to accept it and they refused to expand Medicaid for their people. Now, since that ruling, one by one, a number of Republican governors came around and expand, not that many, but a number of them came around and called, uh, a, a major example is John Kasich in, in, Kasich in um, Ohio, came around and expanded Medicaid. Idaho refused to do it. And that's where we came along in 2017 because we, we came along and said, wait a second here, our legislature, our governor refuses to do this, but we believe it's popular. We believe that even in a deep red state, uh, people believe in healthcare. Uh, they want to see their neighbors and uh, relatives and friends, and in many cases themselves, um, covered. And they and they don't think it's right that people should go without healthcare. So and and there was some polling suggesting that that was the case. Uh, so we decided we we said we could just put this thing on the ballot, and if we get it on the ballot we we could win and right around that time the state of maine put it on the ballot for the first time of any state in the country putting medicaid expansion on the ballot maine moved first and and we thought wow they just showed that you can in fact put it on the ballot and we anticipate that they are going to win when this thing comes up for a vote in the middle of our, so we launched our campaign in the middle of our campaign, it did come up for a vote in Maine and it won with 59% of the vote um, in Maine. Um, so that, that encouraged us to keep go, going forward. Um, 
And I want to pause here and jump forward for a second and say that since Maine uh, moved first, there have been about, I believe now it's about seven or eight states around the country have put Medicaid expansion directly on the ballot. Only one time did it fail, and that was in Montana, and that was arguably for a technical reason. Um, every other time it, it succeeded, including in a lot of deep red states. Here's something, but, but I want to shift gears a little bit and shift and, talk, and tell you all about our, our grassroots tactics and our strategy. And I, and I want to point out something really important. In, so Maine had a pretty, a pretty impressive campaign where they engaged, they had quite a lot of grassroots mobilization. A lot of other states, there was some degree of grassroots mobilization. Um, but it, to some extent, the campaigns were much more traditional in the sense that they were much more um, characterized by TV ads, by um, you know high-level endorsements from political officials and business leaders and things like that, and they didn't necessarily include a whole lot of grassroots activity. Um, a whole lot of, you know, organizations like, like your organization. Um, and I believe based on my analysis of, of Medicaid expansion around the country, um, I believe that has a lot to do with how these votes have come out and what, and it's really important that just about every single time Medicaid expansion has been on the ballot, it is mostly only one in the urban centers and it gets crushed in the rural counties. Um, sometimes, you know, two to one, three to one, four to one <laughs> um, in rural counties. So, so the way that Medicaid expansion passed in a whole lot of states is that the campaigns were able to, uh, on the ballot, the campaigns were able to rack up huge amounts of votes in in the in the blue strongholds and then they were able to you know build out into into some of the suburbs and then and then they just lost everywhere else in the state uh so you get you get things like you know medicaid expansion only winning in um you know one eighth of the counties but still carrying the popular vote right so this has been the trend in nearly every state that has expanded Medicaid. Idaho is a huge outlier. And this is something that we're very proud of. Um, in Idaho, we won the, the popular vote statewide by the largest margin of any state that's had Medicaid expansion on the ballot, including Maine, which in Maine is a purple state, right? Um, it's not a deep red state. Uh, in Maine, it won by the second highest margin, 58, 59%. In Idaho, it won with 61%. In Idaho is, one, if not the deepest red state in the country, it's, it's one of probably three or four of the deepest red states in the country. Medicaid expansion won with 61% of the vote. And it won 35 out of 44 counties, the majority. So we were able to win rural counties. We, we actually won the five most rural counties in Idaho, the, the, the counties with the smallest populations. We won the majority in rural counties where Hillary Clinton only received eight or 9% of the vote. Um, and this is not, you know, a, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that we believe that has a lot to do with the tactics and the strategies that we've deployed. And what and now I want to just I'll just talk about those for for a few moments and then I'd like to just open up and take any questions. Um, our campaign did have traditional elements that many other states have had. Um, that have expanded Medicaid. We did have a large coalition of organizations that came together and raised a lot of money. You know, we had, eventually we had the hospital association on our side that came in and spent a lot of money, put TV ads on the air, 
um, we had a national organization um, called the Fairness Project that supported, and they but and they supported it in most of the other states that expanded Medicaid, uh, if not all of them. Um, and we had some prominent endorsements from elected officials and business leaders and things like that. But what set us apart is that it is the grassroots element of it. And one way to think about it is that we really did believe in, and we do believe in, um, what's often called big organizing. Um, and, and I would say, you know, this isn't the only touchstone for us, but uh, we were very influenced early on by the book. And, and, I, and I highly recommend it if you all haven't already read it, but the, um, the book called Rules for Revolutionaries um, that was written by um, Bernie Sanders' uh, political operatives and, uh, and it's mostly reflections on the 2016 primary campaign and how they were able to mobilize so many people and move from like 5% name recognition to almost winning the primary in like five months or something like that. So um, that's that book really, that that book is one touchstone that lays out a lot of a, a lot of the principles. But then we also picked up those principles, some of them, and and combined them with other principles from other sources, and and really developed our own unique style. And at the center of it is that we really believed in this idea that there are people out there everywhere, regardless of how deeply conservative a community is or how urban or rural or whatever, there are people scattered across the landscape who are yearning to do something big, um, who don't just want to, you know, make a political phone call every once in a while or like, or, or um, you know, click a, an automated uh, email to a legislator or something, or, or, you know, like a post on Facebook, but but who actually wanted to devote themselves to something and, and, and even take on leadership and be the person in their community who is the face of a big, of a big ambitious campaign. Um, and, and we, so we believe that to be true. And we believed that um, given that our challenge is to find them our challenge is to come up with effective tactics to actually identify those people, figure out where they are, get in touch with them, and then and then get them organized and make a big ask of them, actually ask them to take on leadership in their communities. So the, the basic building block of our success in many ways was distributed organizing where we had by the end of our Medicaid expansion campaign, we had about 25 different counties that had their own local volunteer leaders in every county. And then it varied from county to county, but in some cases there were like 200 volunteers, even in like a, a relatively small county, there were like 200 volunteers working under one volunteer leader or, or a set of co-leaders. And you so you really had these dynamic um teams that were all taking on they were the public faces of the campaign they were taking on ownership of the campaign and that made for an entirely different type of persuasion um in that people weren't just being sort of bombarded with um with these slick tv ads that were all from the top down um, but they were they were actually being engaged by members of their own community on the issue. And they were being they were hearing members of their own community who maybe they know from some other relationship speaking up on the radio. And they were seeing those people's names in letters to the editor and op-eds and and that turned out to be so powerful. And and I, I have no other and I, I, as far as other other people's analysis. I haven't heard of another explanation of how it is that we were such an outlier in our ability to really win the rural counties. Um, the best explanation we have is this model of distributed organizing where we were 
where we were challenging and, and inspiring people to lead all over the place. Um, so um, I, I think I'll, I think I've given you at least a sketch of what I wanted to give you in, in terms of just um, some of the tactics strategies that, that we deployed that were at the heart of the, um, of the success we've had. And um, so with that, I think I'll stop and just open up for, for any questions that you all might have um, or any, any, Maybe there's ways that we could try to connect the dots to, to some of the work you're doing. Oh yeah, one thing I, I'm, I'm remembering, I had one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, it was absolutely critical for us that we were able to not just like get people involved and get them committed, but then give them something measurable to work on. So like in our case, a ballot initiative worked extremely well because you just you all these local teams are able to count signatures like this is you know we need 2000 signatures in our community so you, so they're able to like count those and measure those as they go along and it's and it's really inspiring we found to give people something measurable that you can count because that really makes them feel like they're making progress and that was as uh Peter, as you were kind of summarizing the work, it was interesting to hear about all these like really discrete uh, projects that you've worked on. Um, and so it's not, so, so, and that was encouraging for me to see that you really are like identifying clear strategic goals and then, and then challenging members of the organization to work towards them. And that's something that I've just, have found very promising and I've also on the flip side of it is I found that that's what the lack of that is what leads organizations to really stagnate and to kind of fall apart when there's not a clear sense that we have projects and we're moving and we're making measurable progress towards towards our goals um in our case the signature drive was a clear version of that and then after the signature drive we had to then come up with new measurable new metrics like and what and one thing we did was doors knocked so like doors knocked before the election and then we had some other metrics as well uh, but i just wanted to i just wanted to add that in because it's it can be can be sort of tactical and easy to forget but it was absolutely critical to our success but why, why don't i stop there and answer any questions that anyone anyone has